So I'm take this off. I'm losing my umbilical cord. Plug. Empty. The companion of two days gets to go away again for two weeks. Anyway, I thought this would be a the time I'm kind of captive anyway, so I thought I'd just answer a couple more questions. Sorry for the nudity. Um, First, a couple of comments. Uh, Stu, uh, Finn Painter, uh, he he just wrote, uh, he hoped that I'm doing well. Well, Stu, thanks for uh, thoughts and prayers, and uh, all things considered, I'm doing okay. Uh, obviously, continuing to fight. Um, as you can see, we're getting my uh, latest treatment of chemotherapy is going to be disconnected. Um, along the same lines, uh, Buzzsaw, uh, you seem to be doing well. How are you feeling? Doing all right. I do have uh, a lot of fatigue uh, that happens with the, the chemo. And uh, during the first couple of days when I'm hooked up to the bottle and also after the um, hospital, I have to go to the bathroom a lot because they're pumping fluids into me. So I don't sleep much for a day and a half, two days. Because until usually for about 24 hours I'm going to the bathroom every hour and I don't fall asleep fast so I might the first night I might get an hour's sleep over the course of three or four little mini naps and uh, as you can see here Amber's got the stuff ready to go to unhook I figured this would be a good one for uh, answering um, Uh, from Brad Piet. Um, he asked he'd, uh, he'd like an update on my cancer status. Uh, okay, um, well, as of uh, today, this is my 15th round of chemotherapy. Uh, I had a round of uh, a course of six then a scan, then a course of four and a scan, and this is another course of uh, six, and then I'll be getting a scan the first week or so, first or second week of January. Um, because they didn't get a, a, an immediate baseline scan just before I started chemo, they don't know if the tumors were still growing or a lot or little, so by the time they took the first one in August, it looked like the tumors were larger, but they weren't sure if they were had grown larger till the chemo started in June. So it didn't really have a baseline, so we had to use the August one as a baseline. Uh, second scan in October showed that there was a uh, uh, complete stoppage of growth of the tumors and nodules. Um, and in fact, the, the big tumor dropped by 0.1 centimeters on one of the uh, on one of the uh, dimensions, which is good. Vanilla. Mm -hmm. This stuff uh, you can actually taste some of this stuff. This is uh, saline that flushes out the port, uh, which keeps helps get the the chemicals. Uh, from the, the chemotherapy drug out of the port and into into my bloodstream and helps flush and clean the port. And so I'm still fighting. Um, other than the fatigue gradually getting worse, I, I don't notice any difference in how I feel um, physically. So like I'm not feeling like I'm not feeling worse, which is what I mean. Yeah. Um, which I think is is a good thing. Uh, 
I'm maintaining my weight very easily, which is uh, another concern. In fact, uh, the dietitian I've seen that has helped me to lose the 85 pounds that I lost, um, she, uh, she and the doctors don't want me to lose any weight uh, because they want my body to be completely concentrating on, on the cancer treatment. So as much as I'd like to still be losing weight, it's kind of hard to hold back and, and not uh, not do any weight loss and just try and maintain. Sorry. So, yeah. But after uh, I have one treatment coming up, it'll be around the 4th of January, and then the week after that will be a scan, and then the oncologist will see the results and see us, and then... Um, then it'll be determined whether I get uh, get onto another round because uh, I'm sure it won't have been it won't have been killed off and shrunken and disappeared by then. Um, or if it's just not working, then it'll be a case of um, going to Plan B. But I'm I'm thinking this stuff is working. It's Definitely, it has stopped the, the growth, and one of them is shrinking a bit. So I'm going to go for another two weeks. Free! I'm free, free at last. I'm free at last. So, there's a, a brief update on what's happening with my cancer treatment. And uh, appreciate the, uh, the question, Brad. Um, Another one, Cecil 6711, one of the Grad Gang members. Uh, first he said, uh, said hi, um, uh, and hi back at you uh, and, and your wife. Uh, Cecil wrote, where's the one place you want to visit that you haven't been to yet? Great to see a video from you. Uh, just one place, Cecil. Um, there's well, it's more of events, I guess. Some of them. A uh, couple things I wanted to see were uh, the Indy 500. Uh, well, plus the Indy Raceway, which I'd see. Uh, a Daytona 500 race, I'd like to see. Um, although we did tour the track when we were there for the first extravaganza. Uh, I always wanted to see a space shuttle launch, but that's obviously never going to happen now. That was something that had been on my bucket list for a number of years. Uh, but I'd still like to go and see a rocket launch down at Cape Canaveral. Um, the Smithsonian Institute. I'd like to go and see that. I think that would be very fascinating. Uh, also on the west coast in Oregon, I'd like to go to the uh, Aviation Museum and see where the Spruce Goose is. Uh, the plane that Howard Hughes built in, only in the 1940s and then only flew it once and then parked it. Uh, but ultimately, I think the number one place I would like to visit uh, would have to be the International Space Station, just for a day or two. Um, I'd like to experience weightlessness, but I don't think that vomit comet plane that they do it on would be enough for me. I think I'm just enough of a, uh, a space nut to want to actually go up and visit the space station. Um, okay, who else do I have left here? I'm getting to Buck's Woodshop, Matthew. Uh, first of all, say, to hi, say hi to Hope and the kids for us. Um, and Matthew wrote, uh, when I saw you in Florida a few years ago, we talked uh, a little about the Canadian car inspection process. Can you explain how it works as far as older cars and potential rust issues? Uh, this could be a really big uh, subject, um, but since you're asking specifically about older cars and rust, um, it's not really a Canadian inspection process. It's... Uh, Although all the provinces have their processes, um, just looking to put my shirt back on. The um, 
the program is is set up um, province by province. Uh, so here uh, we're in the province of Manitoba, uh, which is just north of Minnesota, North Dakota. Um, our process is has changed actually in the last few years since I used to do inspections. And what the inspections used to entail was you couldn't have any when you were when you had a vehicle. As long as you're, you know, unless you got pulled over because it looked dangerous to the police. Didn't matter about the rust. Uh, if they looked and it looked really bad, they might tell you to go get an inspection. But it was really lax that way on vehicles that you owned already. Um, but when the program was first implemented, it was for when you bought a vehicle and wanted to license it and register it. Uh, and you had to do, uh, uh, you had to have it inspected, and the inspection is a gov was a, a government uh, thing. Our insurance and uh, licensing and all that is all through the government. Um, one of the things you had to, you know, and there, there's a whole criteria. There's about nine or ten sections of the of the manual that you go through, and it covers everything: uh, the amount of play in your steering, right up to the lighting, glass, everything. And as far as older cars go, they had to be within, basically within manufacturer specifications for uh, you know, brake thicknesses, um, uh, brake drums, brake. Uh, pads, shoes, uh, rotors, all had to be within manufacturer tolerances. And you couldn't have any rust that uh, gave a sharp edge that somebody outside the vehicle could get cut on. Um, and an immediate out of service criteria was where you had rust that opened up holes where the exhaust could get right into the vehicle. That was what they call an out of service and you couldn't uh, couldn't get it done. Now for minor minor things, uh, once you had the vehicle inspected, it had to be reinspected if it had failed and you had 30 days to do the repairs and then you got the reinspection for free and the reinspection would cover just the uh, just the items that you had failed on. And the inspections at first were about fifty dollars and took about an hour and the, and the government actually legislated uh, how much the garages could charge for the inspection. And the, the garages had to be certified, the mechanics had to be certified. Um, but they've changed, enhanced the program now. Cause when it first came out, if you had an inspection, it was good for two years. So any time in that two years, if you decided to sell the vehicle, the next person wouldn't have to get it uh, inspected. But that ran into problems because you could have brakes that technically were still good, but thin enough that they weren't going to last more than six, eight months. Uh, and if you didn't do them and you kept the vehicle for a year and a half, you could be selling something where the brakes were worn beyond specs and it would fall through the hoop or fall through the, you know, fall through the process. Um, same with rust. The vehicle could have rusted to where there were now holes in the floor or somewhere in the wheel wells where the fumes could get inside. Uh, they've changed it now uh, and are a lot more inclusive about uh, that. The, the inspection is only good for a year now. Um, and um, they, they've clarified a lot of things, and w amongst other things, they've clarified how much rust, and, and you're checking the frames a lot closer, and unibody structures. Uh, just a little bit of scaling for rust is okay, but when you inspect them, you take a screwdriver or something, and you poke and see if you can, if you poke holes in the frame, it's going to fail. So, it, it's, a, it's not a perfect process but it's not a bad process either. Um, the problem comes when guys are buying the older cars and wanting to put them on the road. Um, we can certainly have a lot more trouble getting something like a rat rod uh, to pass a safety. Um, 
Uh, so it's really not a real cumbersome process. Um, it's a good process. One of the things we're lucky we don't have is emissions testing, but I, I suspect that will be coming here eventually where they will test emissions on vehicles. So right now it's basically only the physical and the electrical operation of the vehicle uh, that, that they cover. So I hope that answers uh, your question. I was going to go into great depth about the whole process, but it would have taken a long time and it would have been a standalone video. Um, the last one that I have is uh, from Tim the Spanner Man. And Tim wrote uh, that I could talk about my family and where and when we met, or when, where I met my wonderful wife, and he's right about that. Uh, how about the travels uh, that I've had, and also give a history of my racing days. And then he finished with just a take care, Tim. Um, first of all, about my family. Uh, Amber and I have been married for coming up on 32 years. We dated for a couple of years before that. And we have three sons. Uh, our oldest, Brad, uh, uh, has a wife and two kids. His wife, Allison, and the kids are uh, Taylor and Aiden, a daughter and a son. Uh, our number two son, AJ, is, he's the one that just opened up a general store uh, back in May. And his uh, wife, Jessica, and they have two girls, uh, Vivian and Shavara. Um, stepping back a bit, um, the granddaughters, Taylor and Vivian, the Brad's oldest and, and AJ's oldest, are both 12. Uh, Aiden, which is Brad's son, is 8, and Shavara, uh, who is uh, AJ and Jess's daughter, is 7. Our number three son, Kyle and, uh, and his partner, Brittany, um, been together for, well, since early high school, grade 9 or grade 10, I think. Um, so they've been together 10 years, and about e just a little over a year ago, they bought a house together. Uh, where did we meet? Well, believe it or not, Amber and I worked at service stations when we met. Uh, she worked at a Shell station, and I worked at a Gulf station, which later became Petrocan uh, in Canada here. Um, my friend at the time worked in the service station in the service base, and I would work midnights and she worked days, so she worked seven till three and I worked uh, midnight till eight at a truck stop pumping fuel. Uh, so in the morning, on my way home, I wouldn't go to home and go straight to bed because I just, I wouldn't. So I'd visit my friend Kelly uh, in the service bays next door and usually I'd go for kind of a, a snack before going to bed. I'd go next door and get a chocolate milk and a chocolate bar and you know, real good, real good uh, eating habits back then. Um, so I went out, uh, I'd you know, go next door to the store, and I, the longest time I just chatted up with her. And then it took a while to convince her to actually go out with me. She didn't want anything to do with me at first. And I finally wore her down where we did go on a, on a date finally. And uh, it went well. And we just kind of started dating from there. Um, didn't do a lot of travels. Uh, every second year with my family, my sisters and mom and dad, we'd go on a holiday somewhere, uh, Western Canada, Eastern Canada, as far east as uh, Ontario. Um, and we went down to uh, California once. Uh, Amber kind of traveled a little bit of the world because her, her dad was in the Canadian Air Force, so she was uh, she lived overseas for a couple of years with her family. But together we haven't done a lot of traveling. Uh, our boys all played hockey, and, and because a lot of our 
the last 22 years we lived in the country, uh, hockey was meant travel. Because uh, you're not just driving to another neighborhood, you're driving to another town. And, and the area that they played hockey in was quite large, kind of almost this whole southern corner, populated corner of the province. So it wasn't uncommon for us to be uh, at the hockey rink three nights a week for practice, sometimes four, depending on uh, what days the boys got practices, because they get two practices a week. And then weekends were usually reserved for games and sometimes if you're lucky you'd have all home games but more often than not we would be traveling you know, one, 100, 200 kilometers for a hockey game unless we went on a tournament and tournaments are usually a weekend long so you'd end up taking a hotel uh, but was quite common for us to go through at least a tank of gas every weekend going to hockey you know, 500 kilometers was uh, quite common by the time we got all the boys going where they were going uh, so, spending our time and money on that, there wasn't a lot of money left to, to do much traveling. So we did do a little bit of camping. We had a, a tent trailer for a while, a really old one. And eventually it was just getting into a where it was going to need new canvas and everything. So we kind of slowed that down. Um, so we didn't really do a lot of traveling. Um, oh, we, yeah, we went out to BC on our honeymoon. Mm -hmm. We go out to BC with the boys. Now, getting into my racing, uh, I think I'm going to leave that for a separate video because uh, that's something I kind of uh, am proud of, uh, what we did, and uh, I think I'll leave that for a separate video, and I want, plus I want to dig out some pictures of stuff that I have. Um, and see if I can get some, some, find some video of the ice racing. I know I have some, but I'll have to find it and get it transferred from, uh, from tapes into, uh, into a digital form so I can do it justice on the, instead of just shooting it from the camera while it's on a screen. So that's it for, uh, I think all the questions I have. And I appreciate the, uh, the responses. And I'll let you go, so uh, take it easy and we'll catch you on the next one.